Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us. I'm Dan Bova from entrepreneur.com. I see the chat is alive with people checking in and saying hi. So great to have you all for the year end edition of Ask Mark featuring the smart, the talented, dare I say handsome, Mark Randolph. Mark, how are you? You are the founding CEO of Netflix. You're an angel investor. You're you're doing so much. You make time for us, Mark. It's always great to see you. Well, Dan, it is a pleasure to be back. It's kind of hard to imagine we're at the end of the year or near the end of the year already. I guess once you're past Thanksgiving, it's in the the end is in sight, I suppose. I guess so. You know, I don't know how many of these we've done so far, but uh, I mean, I had a full head of black hair when we started, so we've been doing them a lot, but it's it's great to see. I, I see so many names popping up. I'm starting to recognize, so great to have you all here. Mark, it's Giving Tuesday uh, here in America, because I know we have some people that are not in America watching, and who better to give us all great entrepreneurial advice than you my friend so thank you once again for for doing this we all appreciate it and my advice is fully tax deductible i've been told so uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to there it is there. now we understand why he's so charitable <laughs> pa paid by the like charles dickens i'm paid by the word it's even better <laughs> excellent well let's let's jump right in you, you know we just mentioned it was thanksgiving then we had uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So, Mark, here's my question. Is it too late? Is it too late if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur and you were going to do something and you were hoping to cash in on the holidays and you and you didn't yet? Is it too late? Uh, it's never too late for anything. I mean, that, that's really fully my belief. Um uh, I, I'm not, um, and listen, this, specifically since this is entrepreneur, uh, and we're talking about entrepreneurship, I will be, I'll certainly admit that it helps uh, to do things earlier. The earlier you start, the better. You know, what do they say? Best time to plant a tree was uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but truly, second best time is now, and, and um, it's, you're never really too old. I mean, I didn't start Netflix until I was in my late 30s. So 38, I think I was, something like that. Um, and I did Looker when I was in, you know, in my uh, early 50s. Could that be? Holy mackerel. Yeah, holy late 50s, early 50s. So you're never too late to start something. If you have an idea, you really got to get it out of your head and um, and do something about it. Tons of people I know start things when they're older. Um, the thing that kills you is always thinking that some better time is in the future. And that's almost never true. If you think it's hard now, it just gets harder. <laughs> Very encouraging, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, uh, on that note, you know, sometimes as it is like the, towards the end of the year, people are like, maybe I should just wait till January. Like maybe people are starting to check out on things. Or is that BS? Is is what you said like literally any day is the best day to start? No, I I, I was when I was saying any day is the best day to start. I was talking more holistically, more in a meta sense uh, that there's always a better time, uh, be a bit better prepared, raised a bit more money, graduated from school, paid off my student, whatever the the reason you have. That's what I'm trying to say don't delay. But listen, you're right. There's absolutely seasonality. And it, depending on what it is you're trying to do, there's clear that some times are better than others. But for example, if you are looking to buy something, if you're looking to get a deal, we are coming into the very best possible time uh, to do that. Uh, everyone's kind of realized by now that any company which is on a fiscal calendar year uh, is trying to make their year, and they're willing to cut you some big deals in the uh, that fourth quarter. Then again, let's take a dip. So there, listen, we're coming into the very, very best time to take some steps and do something. But flipping it around, let's say you're trying to raise money. Well, I will admit, you are coming into a terrible time to try and raise money. Not because you may not be able to get a meeting this week or next week, but the thing is, you're going to start losing people. I mean, people are going to begin checking out. They're not going to be available. 
they are not, they're going to be at a partner's meeting virtually rather than in person because they're in the south of France somewhere. Uh, and then by the time things reconvene in uh, early January, you've lost all your momentum. So yeah, uh, you know, you got to be smart about the timing. So yes, for some things, this is a bad time. For other times, it's a good thing. So in other words, it's, it's case specific. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I want to thank, Mark, we got people from Poland, Mexico, Ireland, Switzerland. Wow. Very cool to see everybody here. Um, so let's let's look at some of the questions that we got earlier before we started uh, the show here. And um, so Janine Ju asks, what at what stage should a self-funded startup pitch to investors? You just mentioned investors. So wondering, um, you know, on our show Elevator Pitch, we often hear the words, you're a little too soon. So uh, <laughs> can you break that down a bit and uh, let us know when's a good time? Well, I think that's uh, my co-investor on Elevator Pitch, Kim Perel. Uh, it seems to be her reaction to most pitches, which is, I love this idea. You're just too soon. Uh, and there's a reason I think that she says that because most of the time people are too soon. Uh, and that's not just for the investor's sake, it's for your sake. Uh, when you raise money, and I've said this before, it comes with certain obligations. You're starting down a path which you cannot go back on. You now have this obligation to do anything you can to make that person's investment pay off. You have to grow the company. You have to scale the company. You have to increase the valuation. You have to engineer a liquidity event at some point in the future to pay them back. Uh, and if you're not ready to start that, you're forcing something which is not ready to be forced. I see that happen all too soon. But how do you know? So uh, first advice is I would not raise venture money uh, to figure out if your idea is a good one or not. And I hear that all too often. I have this great idea. I'm going to go pitch my idea and raise money so I can figure out if my idea works or not. Uh, that is an unbelievable exercise in futility. I mean, maybe, maybe 25, 30 years ago, uh, as was the case when we did Netflix, when you could raise money on a PowerPoint and an idea, uh, but those days are long gone. Now any investor doesn't want to hear your idea. They don't really care about your vision. What they want to do is see evidence that your idea um, is a good one, which means they want to see traction. And when Kim Perel says it's too early, when I say we're a little too early, what we're saying is you have not demonstrated, you have not given me evidence that this thing that you believe is true is actually true. So congratulations to being a self-funded startup. I think that is absolutely the right way to go. Uh, start small, hack, don't build a viable product, build an unviable product. Do something to begin chipping away at the questions which an investor inevitably is going to have so that when you get in front of someone to pitch, you're not saying, imagine if you will, you're saying, let me show you what we've proven. And you will know when it is time. All of a sudden, this thing which you've been pushing and pushing and trying to get movement, all of a sudden it begins to roll and the hill begins to tilt down and it's rolling faster and faster. And you're gonna have this incredible panicky feeling of, oh my God, all the stuff that I threw together with string and tape and uh, it's completely non-viable, non-scalable, non-repeatable. And oh my gosh, people love this and it's taking off. Then you know it's time to raise money. And then the message is very different. It's not, I'm raising money to prove this. You're saying, oh my gosh, this is taking off. I'm looking for money to be able to do this at scale. And don't get me wrong, investors will still have questions. Okay, you've got it going, but it plays in Silicon Valley. Is it gonna play in uh, Kansas City? Uh, great, you've been able to have one salesperson. Can you build sales teams? Can you scale internationally? You'll always have things to prove. But that first step is proving that your idea actually works. And once you've done that, that's the point. I believe it's time, if you want, to uh, go outside and try and raise uh, professional money. 
Excellent. And and dovetailing with that, a uh, question just came in the chat from Obina. Um, wondering if you could break down, like, what are some specific things that entrepreneurs should have in their pitch deck when they are talking to investors? Uh, I know there's a lot that should be in there, but, you know, maybe maybe a couple of big bullet points. Make sure it ha hits these points. Uh, there's a tremendous amount written about what should be in a pitch deck. And what's fascinating is they all seem to be different. Yeah, and that's, that's not surprising. Uh, every company is different for the most part. Every investor is different for the most part. And most importantly, the phase where you're at greatly dictates what it is you need to lay out. But I will give you one thing which is universal, which is keep it simple. You do not want 40 slides in this deck. You want 10, you want 12, you want eight. Uh, and the second, the other piece, boy, see now you're, you tricked me into giving a long detailed answer. I was trying to give a short one. <laughs> so in addition um, to being short, you have to be very, very clear what phase you are at as to what you need to say. Also, you need to be clear, is this a deck that you are pitching in person or a deck that you are mailing to people? Because if you're mailing to people, all they're gonna be doing is skimming. They're not gonna be sitting there and reading the way you do, all 30 pages of it and reading the fine print and absorbing the charts and graphs. No, they're going click, 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 they're going through the whole 10 slide deck in about 40 seconds. And all they're trying to do is make a binary decision of, do I want to spend more time with this person? And so if you think about it that way, the whole point of the deck is not to close the sale. This is a mail-in deck. The whole point of the deck is not to close the sale. The whole point of the deck is to get the meeting, is to get them to want to engage further where you can go into more detail. So we're talking about high level stuff. Basically, what's the idea? Basically, what is the market? Is this something which is niche or do I not understand exactly how big this is? Then very importantly, where are you? How much traction do you have? What evidence do you have? How well do you understand what it is they want to see? And can you lay it out for them? For example, if your business is a SaaS business, there are some very, very common metrics which are used to evaluate SaaS businesses. And first of all, you better know them. And second of all, lay them out. Don't make them ask. They're going to immediately recognize what your time to repay your acquisition cost is. And that's just a common metric that if you can't say it's you know six months, it's nine months. It's 21 months. If you don't have that, not only is it not a point of what the data is, but it shows you actually know the data or more importantly, you don't know what's important in a business. Okay, that was really quickly. That's a mail-in deck, short and to the suite. Think about it purely from, will this get them curious enough and intrigued enough and greedy enough that they're willing to take that meeting? <laughs> when you're pitching in person, the deck's even shorter because I'll tell you the truth, you're not going to get through it. You're going to show the first three slides and they're going to interrupt you and you're going to be going off on a tangent. And that's fine. It's kind of the point. In which case, then the slides end up being illustrations for points you know they're going to ask you about. And that can be done with the front slides or a deep appendix. But know your stuff and have the slides there to illustrate it. Do not expect you're going to get through the whole thing. So basically, what's the product? What's the market? What traction do you have? Who's the team? What financing do you already have? What's your existing cap structure? And then a few more about things that may be specific to your business. Do not do the stupid hockey stick. <laughs> well, we did uh, $100,000 in 2020, 2021. We did 200 in 2022 and 2023, we're doing 17 million. And in 2024, 275 million. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> don't, don't bother. The same thing with the ones that go, I'm making a, uh, 
I'm making a widget that helps for cleaning clothes. And the market for clothes is $300 trillion. <laughs> just imagine if we got 1% of that. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to ask you about that because I, I know you love that. Uh, so that's a great It's one. my favorite. Well, I could uh, do the pitch deck of, uh, if I could do the lecture about what not to put in the pitch deck, yeah. believe me. That would be 200 slides long. <laughs> well, Mark, that was awesome. And you saved people from reading about 50 books. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pitch you an idea that just came in on the chat. Because, you know, look, I've never launched a billion dollar business. So what do I know? Uh, this came in from Arthur. He says, I have an idea for a business, mind swapping. I'm working with a doctor named Mr. Milton. Doesn't say Dr. Milton. Mr. Milton. We can change the world, not joking. What do you think, Mark? How much are you going to put in? <laughs> well, Dan, I left my wallet in my other pants. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I'm a little short this week. But, you know, listen, Art, if I can call you Art, um, listen, the idea is, in my opinion, the idea doesn't really count. I don't really care what your idea is uh, because like any entrepreneur, uh, you and Doc Milton are going to start and then almost immediately you're going to bump into something and realize uh, you have to do something differently. Uh, and so the original idea is going to get left on the table. And that's what I'm curious about is what's your ability to pivot, to change, to learn, to try, to not get hung up on one idea, but be flexible to adapting. Um, and so to be honest, I pay very, very little attention to what the original idea is. What I'm looking at is you, is do I think that you have the skill? Do I think you have the tenacity? Do I think you have the track record uh, to actually take this idea and inevitably find out something's wrong with it and be flexible enough to change to something else and keep going and keep going and keep going? And I'm going to make that decision partly partly being about 10% on what you can promise you will do and 90% on what I think you've already demonstrated you're able to do, which unfortunately makes it tricky when you're a first time entrepreneur coming in with an out there idea, but you got to start someplace. Mark, I'm going to volunteer us. Uh, we'll swap brains, Art. So just DM us after the. Uh, after the <laughs> yeah. I, the, the good news is that because I don't really care much about the idea, even ones that on the face of it seem ridiculous, uh, that's fine. That's as likely to succeed as some of the ones where I go, oh my God, that is so self evidently going to kill it. I just. <laughs> I've learned how little we all know about what's going to work and what's not going to work. That's great. But mind swapping. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Art, don't quit your day job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of learning, we got a question from Amar. Uh, he says, as a student with tech skills in today's tech and AI boom, do you advise focusing on building strong tech skills before developing an idea, or is it beneficial to prioritize idea generation over tech expertise? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, as always, I'll give you my first uh, response only because it was jumps into mind, which is the tech skills are way more important. But then I immediately, since I always argue with myself, went, yeah, but if you spend your whole career getting better and better at tech, then you're going against the principle we talked about in the very, very first question, which is you just got to start and doing something. Um, so I'm going to say that the two of them are, are um, inextricably linked to each other. And let me give you something which is slightly uh, adjacent to it, to your question, which is when I'm inter interviewing a engineer, um, of course I want to learn what they've done before. I want to learn how fluent, they, get a sense of how fluent they are um, at their ability to build. But what's most interesting to me is hearing about their side projects. 
uh, because what I've found is that most people who are really eager to improve their skills don't necessarily do it at their day job. They do it in their after hours stuff. They do it on the things they hack together on the side. I remember, uh, this is way back when I was at a company called Borland International, which was a big company that really made programming languages as its core business. And uh, one of the head technologists there stopped in. We, we, we were sitting, sat down next to me. We we're talking about something. And he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to learn a new language. And uh, so I hacked something together. You want to see it? And it was this complete submarine game that he had built like overnight. Like he stayed up all night and used this language to build a submarine game. And what that said to me was, was not, oh, oh, pretty cool that you can build a submarine game in one night. It was the fact that that was the method that he chose to learn the language. Uh, and it's very similar to the way you learn a spoken language is by speaking it. So in other words, my answer is, listen, focus on learning the technical skills. That's such a critical thing. It's that the difference between being amazing and being great is like 10x. So be amazing. But a great way to do it is to have the idea, some crazy idea, and then go off and see if you can code it, see if you can build it, uh, and combine the two. So there you go. There's a non-answer. Both. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. <laughs> um, another question just came into the uh, chat from Mark. I think this is a common a common fear with but a specific instance. So he says, a six billion dollar company has asked for a meeting to see my software. I've accepted the meeting. How do I know if they're interested in working together or if they're just interested in stealing my idea? Mark, oh. you may have stumped Mark. <laughs> yeah. Once again, I'm wrestling with myself. Um, because rule number one is uh, someone who tries to be a mentor or an advisor is do no harm. And so I'm trying to, even though you can tell a lot of my answers are flippant or funny or uh, cutting, I do try and make sure I don't mess somebody up. So the, the thing I'm struggling with in my head, Mark, is that I've said over and over and over again, no one's going to steal your idea um, because that is the single biggest reason that people don't start. I have an idea. Oh, but I can't do anything because I can't tell anyone or right? because they're going to steal my idea. I can't raise money because they're going to steal my idea. And I find I have to fight so hard against that entrenched paranoia that people can't tell anybody what they're working on because you're going to get your idea stolen. But there are some scenarios where people are, I won't say out to steal your idea, but they're perhaps not being completely transparent about their reasons for wanting to dig in. And $6 billion company wanting you to come in and tell them what you're working on, you would better understand the context under which this discussion is taking place before you completely um, bear all. Uh, and obviously, I don't know enough of the details from a few sentence question in a chat to be able to give you better advice, except there are circumstances where you need to be careful. And I'll give you uh, uh, some context here. Uh, and it's from the VC world. So I'm a huge fan of venture. All of my companies have been venture backed. Uh, I would never have been successful without people who believed in me. So many of my friends are venture, are VCs. They are honest, they're hardworking, they really have your back. But I also know that a lot of times they'll take a meeting as part of their education. They wanna know what's being worked on out there. I've already got an investment with a company in this space. I wanna make sure, I wanna see what everyone else is working on. So yeah, come in and pitch. So it's not stealing the idea, 
but it's not fully transparent that you're going into pitch because they really are interested in investing in it. And this has the possibility of being something like that, where the company's already working on stuff and they really want to understand what everyone else is working on. Uh, but it could be acquisition, which is a good thing. Uh, it could be they want to hire you. Uh, that could be a good thing. They could be they want to buy your pro use your product for something. That could be a good thing. So I guess part one is you take the meeting. You talk about what you're working on. I wouldn't necessarily get into the explicit details of how the code works, especially if you've spent a lot of time doing trial and error and have done 100 things wrong and now have finally figured out the one thing that works. Um, get far enough along that you say, okay, I think we've had this discussion long enough. I'd love to really say everything I'm doing on it, but let's do a non-disclosure at this point. Uh, and you know, non-disclosures aren't watertight, but it's a step that a company will not go through if they're just looking to kick tires. Um, and if they are willing to go through the step of doing it, it's fine. Again, I even hate to have said that in a public setting that there's a role for a non-disclosure agreement. Because again, that's like the no one steals your ideas that that's too often everyone just falls back on that. But I guess my point is that small company, one person has some code, has something working, big $6 billion company wants to look. I guess I'd be a little careful at that point. All right. There, there you have it. See, uh, see, Dan, I can do, I can do nuance. You I can, can <laughs> subtle, you bob nuance. and weave. That was, that was great. That was um, a scary one because everyone's going to go, see, I was right. <laughs> They're going to steal my, my, my idea. Now, well, it's, it's a great question, Mark. So thanks for sending that in. Um, so a uh, question that just came in from Syed. Um, it's, it's asking about your Netflix days. I do want to remind everyone that Mark uh, does not, currently work at netflix hasn't worked there for a while so see a couple of things about pitching movie ideas um so he's he's not the guy you're going to want to talk to for that unless he is i don't know maybe he's got a movie studio in his basement what do i know uh, attic <laughs> Uh, in, the but the, in the attic. Okay, good. So uh, this question from Syed, uh, what strategies did you use to manage risks and uncertainties during Netflix's early stages? And what guidance would you offer today's entrepreneurs who are tackling challenges in new markets and technologies? That's the end of the question. It's a big question, <laughs> but uh, see if there's any, any piece of that that, uh, that grabs you. Well, the first thing is that risk and uncertainty are um, inseparable uh, aspects from doing a startup. If, <clears throat> if there wasn't risk or uncertainty, it wouldn't be a startup. You'd be doing something that you already know. You'd be buying a McDonald's franchise, which comes with 17 binders of every specific thing you have to do in every possible circumstance. Startups are the exact opposite of that. And Netflix was the same. We, Everything was a risk. Everything was uncertain. And the way you manage risks and uncertainties is that you try and make the risks and uncertainties as small as you can, which is that you're taking small swings. You're not betting the farm on every decision. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes you do need to say that I'm taking the big risk here. And I recognize that we could um, lose it all based on this. But for the most part, for every one of those, there's a hundred small swings. And I mean, let me just give you a, a two quick examples. So a big swing. So starting the company to begin with, uh, we, when we launched, as you historians know, or may, anyone who has read my book back here, uh, that will never work, knows uh, we bet the company on DVD working. Um, uh, and at the time, there was probably less than 200,000 DVD players sold. So there was no assurance that DVD was going to work, that DVD was going to penetrate, that DVD was not going to get into a Betamax versus VHS battle. That, and we bet the whole company on DVD working. And had it not worked, we would have gone out of business. That was a big bet. But for that one big bet, there was a thousand small bets where we learned to do the tests, to try things we weren't certain whether they're gonna work in very small, scrappy, easy, cheap ways. 
So if they didn't work, we didn't say, oh my gosh, that was like two months of effort. That was like uh, half of my uh, seed investment. No, they were all small swings. And I think one of the things that I've gotten very, very good at is learned how to test things and how to try things and how to take risks in a way that I've really minimized the damage um, if they go wrong. Uh, and I've, I've, I've said it again, but it bears repeating for the 393rd time is that the sign of being a great entrepreneur is not how good your ideas are. It's how clever you can be about figuring out quick and cheap and easy ways to try them. Uh, and that by far is the best way, I think, to manage uncertainties and certainly how we did it at Netflix and at every other startup that I've been a part of. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, I love it. Lots, lots of comments, lots of more questions coming in. This is great. We're starting to round the corner towards the end, but we could squeeze in a couple more. Um, hopefully this isn't too long of a, a, a question, but curious, uh, this came in earlier from Paul Rydell, who says, what are the key ingredients needed to create a successful paid membership, uh, for a video for video courses? Um, now specifically what he's asking is he wants people to pay for stuff that you could kind of find for free on YouTube. Do you have any advice <laughs> for, <laughs> selling something that people it's not going to be exactly the same but they might be able to find something similar for free well absolutely there's i mean certainly people pay look at bottled water i mean right. water's i know that in some part some parts of the world and some communities but listen bottled water holy crap if you can sell bottled water you can sell anything but you're right when you're selling something which someone can get free elsewhere you would better be able to provide some other value. Um, and certainly in a, uh, a streaming services uh, um, perspective, there's all kinds of stuff besides just getting it. And that ranges from the technical. In other words, am I streaming in higher definition perhaps? Uh, am I able to stream to multiple devices perhaps? I am able to stream with a lower mean time between failures than other places is there left buffering i mean so there's the technical piece which is a very very hard thing to get right then there's finding do i have a better algorithm for helping predict what you're going to like that ends up being a cute huge one um am i curating for you in other words yes there's free stuff out there but good luck finding it all and maybe i can provide a service where i curate it so there's all kinds of ways to layer on services. We were just talking about um, with some friends uh, the other night about uh, open source uh, software, which is how can companies make a living selling things which anybody could get free? I mean, the classic case, at least in my generation, was Unix, open source, free. Anyone can go get a copy of Unix, but yet a company like Red Hat can build a huge business on top of it. And they do it by extending it, by saying, here's the free stuff, but here's some stuff that we've built on top of it that allows you to leverage it. So for example, you could build community around these free videos. You could put in place discussion groups, chats, you could have expert commentary. Um, there's service. You could say there's all kinds of ways that we're going to do this sequentially where you get a subscription and you get them all in a row. I, I don't know. But yes, being creative, there's a million ways that you could find ways to take a resource which is free and find ways to bundle it, serve it, slice it, dice it, curate it um, that you can charge for. So don't despair. And in fact, in some ways, your gross margin is going to be wonderful since your cost of goods is close to zero. That's great. Um, so as this is the, uh, probably the, la well, definitely the last one we're going to do this year, but we are going to, uh, everyone who has a calendar handy, uh, mark down January 9th and February 15th when we'll be doing the next ones. But for the purposes of 2023, that's what you're in, right? Um, wondering, uh, January 1st, Mark, are you a new year's resolution guy? Are you, do you have any resolutions and can you offer any resolutions 
that might be helpful to the people who are listening in on this call who are, you know, in the startup phase of their business? Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, so I'm, I am a New Year's resolution guy. Like all of you, I'm pretty hit or miss. Um, like not that many of you, I've been doing New Year's resolutions for a long time. Uh, and I've learned probably what I believe is the most important aspect of a New Year's resolution is simple rather than a wish list of all the 40 things that I wish I could do with my life. No, I've kind of realized I've got to pick one. And uh, if I'm really going to be able to focus on it, and it certainly helps if it's quantifiable. Uh, my resolution for 2023 was writing. I wanted to uh, write something at least once a week. Uh, and so far, so good. I've put, I've posted something uh, every week. And if you want to read them, you can uh, find them on my website, markrandolph.com. I'm on Substack. I'm on Medium. You can subscribe to get them emailed to you. But I publish something once a week. And I look like I'm I'm now the ends in sight. I think I'm going to make it. 52 posts. So good job, awesome. Mark. <laughs> uh, so next year, as I'm learning a language, I've been working on it now for about uh, a bit more than a year. A new language, different language. Year and a half. Um, just to get the grammar, get the vocabulary. But of course, as you know, that doesn't count for anything. You still can't speak. So you've got to begin doing spoken language. So starting for 2024, I start doing the uh, online conversation with what, someone. What language? That, uh, Italian. Ah. So um, that will be, we'll check in at the end of 2024 and see how I'm doing with that one. But for all of you out there who are entrepreneurial minded, my God, the, the best resolution I can think of is start something especially for those of you who aren't doing anything right now, but are dreaming about it is take that first step. And if you want to be quantifiable, you're going to try one thing at least every quarter. And I'm not saying raising money. I'm not saying quitting your job. I'm saying, God, I have this idea. I'm just going to make a web page and see if I can sell it. I'm going to do a Kickstarter. I'm going to set up a bake sale. I'm going to be at the local county fair selling this thing I'm making. Do something that allows you to collide your idea with reality in the most trivial, non-scalable, non-repeatable, hack-worthy version. Because that one step is 90% of it is just getting started. And so I think what a great resolution for you to go. 2024 is the year I start. And then in 10 years when you have a big successful business you're gonna laugh and go oh my god that all started can you believe it with that one stupid thing i did in q1 of 2024. <laughs> that's awesome i love that that's such great advice too that 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 one thing uh, i have many friends who someone said uh i'm gonna run the marathon this year or as you said i'm gonna write every day but just that one goal instead of like i'm gonna be healthier you know, <laughs> right. it's not, it's I'm gonna eat better. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to yeah, start yeah. exercising. I'm going to call right, my right. friends once a week. Uh, yeah. Good for you. So final question to the uh, co-founder of Netflix. I know you're not like a huge movie buff, but what is the co-founder of Netflix's favorite holiday movie, Mark? Oh my God. I don't, I have no idea. There's <laughs> so much to watch. Uh, we, and we watch stupid stuff. Usually it's because my, during the holidays, my, ki my adult kids, they're all adults, but we'll all go watch something that we, from their childhood. Like right. I, this weekend over Thanksgiving, we were all hanging out. We watched Harry Potter one, uh, <laughs> Sorcerer's Stone. So that that's the kind of holiday movie advice you're going to get. Uh, but I guess <laughs> in all seriousness, I'm going to have to dust off a copy of uh, doc Hollywood and mm. uh and uh, throw that into the dvd player which i still have a dvd player and uh and see how that's aging i'm gonna challenge you throw in a fellini and turn off the um the closed captions see if you can uh understand oh, what's geez. going on 
<laughs> no, I'd struggle just watching Friends Italian <laughs> overdub. That would be hard enough for me. <laughs> right. so. Awesome. Well, everyone, I want to thank you for the great questions and for watching. And it looks like a couple of you are even connecting here on the chat, which is awesome. And a big thanks, as always, to Mr. Mark Randolph. Mark, you mentioned your website, but where can people uh, keep track of all the great things you're up to? First of all, Dan, thanks very much for the, for this and uh, have a great rest of the end of the year. And for those of you listening, I did mention the fact that I do write something once a week. It's on the subjects usually of entrepreneurship, startups, work-life balance, or Netflix stories, or just some ridiculous bullshit that happens to pop into my mind at the time. And really, you can check it. You can find it on Substack or Medium. Come to the website. You'll find it there. You can subscribe, and I'll email it to you. So that's the best way. And when you're there, you can check out all things Mark Randolph at markrandolph.com. But listen, something a little new. Uh, I have an entrepreneurial community that I run. We're just coming up on 2,000 members. It's all entrepreneurship all the time, all kinds of advice from uh, experienced and aspiring entrepreneurs, the whole range of things. Uh, it's called Neverland, and you can find a way to apply. Unfortunately, you have to apply. Uh, at markrandolph.com uh, forward slash community. Um, and hopefully I can see you all there. That's excellent. Wow, that's great. Well, I hope everyone takes Mark up on that. The guy seems to have some good advice, so I think it's going to be worth your time. Um, but Mark, uh, great talking to you as always. Have a happy and healthy rest of this year, and we'll see you next year. We'll see everyone, remember, January 9th, and February 15th, mark it in your calendars, and we will see you all again soon. Thanks, Dan. See you all soon. All right.